everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we're going to talk about doing the crimson armor that I do on my uh, Slaves to Darkness. I had a lot of questions about it for my, my Crimson Cabal Force uh, when I posted up my uh, Chaos Warriors and in recent hobby cheating videos so I thought I'd take a, a, a do a whole video where I show you exactly how I went about it. So here I have my Chaos Lord on uh, Karkadrak. Um, he's all puttied up because the parts under here are already painted since they were beneath the armor so then we just have our, our putty over him. Uh, I didn't bother to putty the whole cloak because I just set that black so I could tell kind of how light everything else was looking in comparison. Uh, so now we're going to get to the painting. Now I'm going to warn you most of this at the beginning will be airbrush and then we'll finish up with brush. But that being said, I thought we'd start over here so you can see uh, the paints that I use under this. So our high highlight's gonna be Glacier Blue from Vallejo. This is actually a game color, but I've, this is my thinned down airbrush version. I just pre-mix some for airbrush, really like them. I have some uh, Nocturna uh, Fantasy from Vallejo Crimson. I have some uh, Scale 75 Fantasy and Games Bloodfest Crimson. You can see the difference there. You see how this one has more red in it, more red-orange. This one has more purple. So we use both of those. Uh, and then we have a little bit of inks we're going to use in some amount. We have a Process Magenta here just for a light tone. We have Red Earth, which is used in a very, 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 very minor amount to just influence the, the red tone and push a little more orange back into it. And then we have Payne's Gray, which is what we use for our shadow color. Um, when you put this blue together with the red, you get a nice purple. Now, technically, this armor breaks a rule in that it has a cold highlight and a cold shadow, and I don't care because that's what I wanted to do with them, and I like that effect. So you can sometimes break the rules when, you know, when you feel like it. So I'm going to pause here. We'll jump over to the airbrush booth, and I'll show you how we attack this. All right, so we're over here in the airbrush booth. Now, uh, so we understand, uh, this whole time I'm gonna be using my uh, Iwata HP CS Highline. Uh, this has a really fine spray control. I have the actual like air nozzle down here turned way down so very little air comes out. I don't know if you can hear that or not, it's very quiet. Uh, we have, uh, we're set at 18 PSI and we're gonna start with a two to one thin, so two thinner to one paint uh, of the Bloodfest Crimson. So the first step is just setting the kind of base tone over the, the whole armor. Now this is gonna be very, very pink when we do the first layer. Um, you'll notice that when I'm hitting this armor, I'm trying my best to be really, really uh, controlled with how I apply this. I don't want it fooling anywhere. Nothing like that. So this is very thin, thin, thin paint, and that's okay. We can do thin paint. We just have to really control how much we're actually spraying out. And if I hit stuff like the other things that I haven't painted yet, like his uh, sword or his arm or the fur, I don't care because that's all going to get covered in different colors later, so it doesn't really matter. So we just kind of cover this all up here. Nice thin coat of it. And we're good to go. There's his armor and his hand. Great. Okay. So easy peasy, lemon squeezy. There we go. Now he's all, he's a pretty pink knight. Uh, oh, sorry. His little leg, back leg plates. Almost forgot those. we'll get this little thing too. We've got a lot of different little armor plates. Okay, so once we have that done, then what I'm gonna do is, I haven't changed the paint, but I'm gonna go in with the same crimson, and we're gonna find and start establishing some initial areas where I want it to be deeper. So basically, in the area that I'm gonna pick as my shadows, I'm gonna start laying in a little stronger amount of this crimson. So like here on this plate, for example, I'll bring the shadow up toward the top, right? Here on this, again, shadow toward the top, this is tucked away from everything. So I just want to make sure those areas are really saturated. Here on this arm plate, we're going to come in and get the top real strong under there. 
that plate. So you see what I'm saying here. I'm using the angles of this thing. If it were rounded, I would be doing the same thing with the whatever area. Whatever area is going to end up being in shadow, I'm pulling up toward that and making sure that I'm setting that just quite, quite pink, basically, right? And again, there's, it doesn't have to be, you can kind of pick the logical sense if you have a good part of it of where the shadows are going to be. If this were like a chaos shield, it'd probably be the, uh, it'd probably be the bottom of the thing that would be in shadow depending on the angle of the shield. The, the new chaos shields and the new kit are all over the shop crazy, so it's kind of whatever. Just pick a shadow scheme for your, your minis and you're good to go. Okay. So, good to go there, we've got that reinforced. Now what we're gonna do is just walk down the progression. So I still have that same thinned Bloodfest Crimson in here, but I'm gonna dump most of the excess out. So you can see now, that's what I've got left in there. I know it's kind of dark, I apologize, but there you go. Most, basically most of the paint's gone. Then I'm gonna refill it with, again, we'll go two to one, but this time I'm just gonna take the standard Nocturna Crimson just a little more red. I'm sorry, a little more purple, I apologize. Go about the same ratio there. But I'm also just gonna put a single drop of that red earth in there. So this has a lot. This is about one to 10 of the existing ratio, okay? So it's a very, very small amount, but that ink is very potent. So you can see how much uh, we've got in there. We mix that up, nice and nice and stirred. And you can see how that red earth just has a, a heck of an effect. Like it's it's shocking how much it actually influences that red color. So once we've got that, we of course do a little test on the back of our hand, right? Sorry, I was realizing his head's off camera here and I needed to get his head. There's his little happy head. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in and we're gonna just reinforce toward those shadows with this color. It's not gonna have a huge impact, but it's gonna set a little bit more of that red tone that we want. Because we do want this to be crimson, not pink, not magenta. It's gotta be crimson. Think like dark red wine. That's effectively what we're aiming for ultimately. I'm trying to decide what on his leg is armor and what's a boot. He has weird feet. I can always black that out if it's wrong. No big deal. So, once again, we just kind of push toward those shadows. Same thing as before, we'll get up under, you know, way up under here, uh, under his arms and stuff real well. Since that's gonna be completely in shadowed, basically. Nice, simple step. We're just strengthening up that color, making it a nice, strong version of that. Pulling constantly toward those shadows. Okay. So, the reason we're doing that is because we want to start setting some of those more aggressive tones. One of the things you're trying to do when you're when you're trying to nail a sort of interim color like this, you want to make sure that, you know, the airbrush is a good tool. It can work fast. So let's use it to our advantage. Let's make sure we have all those tones in there working for us, right? So if we want a little more red, let's lay some more red down now at this stage when we can easily then reduce it later, back it out later. This is often one of the ways I use my airbrush is I think, what are the kind of tones that I'm gonna want in here? Every paint is slightly transparent. And when you incorporate more of those varied colors in there, your brain doesn't even consciously see it, but it knows it's happened. So given that, and then we're good to go there. Uh, our next step is going to be to continue shadowing. So take that big bunch of paint. We're going to dump most of that out. I'm just dumping it into my paint cup there. 
Okay. All right, now, so again, we're back down to basically just an almost empty paint cup. Not washing the whole thing out, don't need to. But there's still, I, I left a little bit in there. Now we're gonna get out our Dollar Rowney Payne's Gray ink. So this is a blue-black. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna go five to one. So 10 drops of thinner to two drops of ink, okay? Because this stuff is real, real strong. And we want it to be real, real thin. Then we'll mix that up. And you can see now instantly how dark that is. We test on the back of our hand there. That's the color we get. So now we're gonna reinforce our strong shadows. So we have to be real careful about this because we don't want, we don't want to go overboard. So we're just real careful, like a, like a little surgeon with our airbrush, moving over those areas that we want in that nice deep shadow. Don't have to get it all at once. Notice how little air I'm using, how little I'm rocking the trigger back. Very, very, very light touch. Do it multiple times and keep working that. All right? No issue at all. So we can just very carefully work our way around the mini. And you'll see how I'm just finding each little shadow, getting the airbrush right up in there, working real close. Just making sure that I get each one of those little shadows. The most important part is on these big plates that we establish a nice, strong, directional shadow. That's what's going to draw the eye. Okay? That's what's important. So when we lay in these real deep shadows under the armor... We want to make sure that, as you can see here on this like back leg plate, you can see how that's really causing that directionality. And that's what we want. So, continue this, and just reinforce some of my deepest shadows here as I make my way around the thing. And then next, now is when, now I'm down to my deepest shadow. So now I'm going to clean out my paint cup completely. I'll do that off camera. And I'm going to come back. And we're going to uh, then start laying in some of our highlights. So I'm just going to clean all this up, hit all the rest of them. I'll be back in just a moment. Okay, so airbrush is all reset, and now we've just got pure thinned glacier blue. It's thinned a little bit more than two to one. So let's flip our bad boy around here. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick the opposite side of wherever we placed our shadows, and we're gonna place our highlights, okay? So in this case, the rear of this panel. Again, working very thin, very intentionally with the airbrush, treating it just like I would a normal brush. Right, you see like the, the motion I'm making. Almost as though I were painting with a physical brush. Trying to respect where the highlights would be stronger, where they'd be weaker, but I am gonna overemphasize the highlights. And the reason I'm gonna do that is because later on I'm gonna wanna come back in and do some glazes and knock these back down. If my highlights are weak, then I'm gonna go too far when I glaze. If I over highlight with the airbrush, which again is something I think a lot of us sometimes always fear that we can make things look kind of over highlighted or cartoony with the airbrush, which is true. You can absolutely do that, but that's okay. Just don't make that your final step. One of the real keys to using the airbrush is to not let this kind of a high highlight or something like that where you're, where you can have this real kind of spread out powdery look. Just don't let that be your final step. You can always tell when something has that airbrushed look. And part of the reason that exists like that 
is because the person didn't go back in and then sort of do the rest of the glazing like you would do in anything, like you have to do even with your airbrush to bring all those tones into line. So you can see how right now I'm just making all these little highlights around him, just popping all this stuff out. And yes, it looks kind of ugly at this moment, and that's all right. It looks overemphasized and kind of uggo. And that's all right, our little Chaos Lord will be pretty. He'll be a pretty little, he'll have his pretty little pony and he'll be a pretty little boy in a moment. We just gotta get there. Almost every miniature has an ugly phase. Well, welcome to this one's ugly phase, right? Where we have these extreme sort of highlights uh, that are just way over the top. And that's all right. Get the fingies there. through make sure we've got everything nice and set make sure I didn't miss any plus spots like the bottom of his leg there all right and now we've got them all nice and highlighted now what we're gonna do is again we're gonna go ahead and dump most of that glacier blue into the this is what I do a lot I don't I instead of changing the paint all the way I want a little bit of that previous paint in there so that it's actually like again mostly empty so that it's just constantly picking up a little bit of that color then we're going to get out our process magenta ink this is a little bit weaker than the Payne's gray so i go about four to one here so in other words i'm going to put in two drops of ink to about eight drops of of thinner something like that again none of these are like exact ratios or should ever be need to be thought of in in those discreetive terms there's no exact ratio. It can even vary because you have different humidity or something like that in your area. What I'm gonna get is something very pink. Looks like that. Okay. I'll just do a little test here on my hand. Good. Okay. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna find the edges of that, uh, the edges of that highlight we just did. And we're going to soften that transition up with some of this pink. This is a very quick step because you're just literally hitting the all the edges of your highlight. Just softening it down with that pink. This is because here in a moment we're going to do a bigger transition on it. And now we and we just want to have. We don't want it to be quite so stark and quite so powdery. This helps smooth that out. The more lighter colors you use like that, the more powdery your work tends to end up. Again, it's one of those things that contributes to that kind of airbrush look. But that's a quick step. We just literally place that pink against all the whites, or against all the glacier blues, I should say, sorry. The reason I use blue with this magenta is because it just makes it colder. It's more visually interesting than just using white. In general, when you're kind of when you're working, avoiding white is is not a must. A lot of people tell you never use white. You can you can use white. I use white all the time and stuff like non-metallic. But when I'm just trying to have like an armor like this, where I want it to be really visually appealing, I'll try to avoid white and instead use an ice yellow or a glacier blue. It's just more it's just more interesting because of the way it, it sets the tone. You get a nice cold light instead of just, uh, instead of just some standard, you know, yellow white. Okay, so now I'm gonna empty my cup again completely uh, because it's time for the next step of paint and that one's gonna be a real fun one. So, uh, you'll see when we're back in a moment and we bring all this together. So, back in just a minute.
All right, so now is where the magic happens. So this is how we take this very crazy sketch and we bring it into line. To you do that, we're gonna get out some golden heavy body acrylic, alizarin crimson. Uh, when this is a super thick, you know, artist paint, I think when most people think of this, they don't think about airbrushing, but all you have to do is thin it down. So here we've got it very, very thin. This is using both my traditional thinner and flow aid mixture of 80, 20 thinner and 20% flow aid, as well as a few drops of water at a crazy ratio. Again, it's, it's hard to count because this doesn't come out in drops. It just comes out in little squidges. So, you know, thin. Uh, the better way to do it is you test and as you can see here on the back of my hand That's about the consistency that I'm getting there. That's right where I want it So now what I'm gonna do is come in here and over not the most extreme But just kind of bring that up and just very lightly Start glazing that red in there that crimson and That alizarin crimson, you know Bob Ross. He was a smart guy. He knew what he was talking about he, uh, he used that in all, most of his projects, and it's just such a wonderful tone. It just adds this great color to this. And when you put it over that, that sort of pinky magenta that we've got, you just get this really nice red tinge. I hope that's coming through on the camera, just how nice that looks. So we're just gonna go through and we just cover almost all the dark and most of the light is basically what we're doing here. So by laying a little bit of that crimson over all of that dark blue, we end up in the end warming up those shadows a little bit. In some places I will cover the light completely, like say down here on the bottom of his foot. Like down here there wouldn't be as much light so that would be completely in the crimson color and that's fine. Up here in these more exposed areas, I'll leave a little bit of that blue there for us. Or sorry, yeah, a little bit of that glacier blue. I know it sounds strange because it doesn't really feel like blue. Again, always just turning the figure to make sure I get it how I want. And just little things, painting with it, painting with the airbrush, just like I would with the brush. Okay, so you can see how this is how we glaze with the airbrush and most importantly, this is how we get rid of that airbrushed look. When we do this final glaze of something highly pigmented like this, you can do the same thing. If you don't have that same heavy body acrylic, if you've got like any kind of crimson ink, you can do the same thing. I mean, this is a very specific kind of color, um, but there are other crimsons that are like it. It's just a really, really nice tool in your toolbox, let me say, to have that alizarin crimson. Um, I'm a big fan of heavy body acrylics in general. I use them quite often because they are so rich in pigment. And what they do is, because they can be thinned way down, but still maintain their color, they become really transparent. You'll get the same thing out of inks. I just happen to like this option a little better for this because I don't really have an ink that has the same richness of tone. And that's what I'm aiming for here. This real nice, rich, crimson color. All right. So that feels pretty good. Uh, we'll go ahead and do his head here. So what I'm gonna do next, uh, there's his little head is we're gonna go back over to the painting desk and I'm gonna show you how we uh, can touch this up with our brush and then continue to pick out the details, and continue to focus the pyramid down so that we establish the sort of full range of what's going on, really pop those highlights out and uh, control those shadows, especially on this guy where we have all this ridiculous detail It'll be a good example of kind of showing you how we, we deal with all these different surfaces. Because the airbrush in the end on a figure like this, it can only do so much for us. Uh, it's, you know, this guy has a ridiculous amount of tiny, tiny, tiny detail. So it's going to be brush time. 
Now, one thing I will do before I go back over there, when you thin paints to this level, especially reds and crimson colors, um, especially with this much uh, medium in them, they are going to get real shiny. And we don't want that because that'll influence our ability to see and understand our, our color, our true color, and our blends later. So once that's all dry, I'll give it a few moments. Then I'm going to hit everything with a nice mix of varnish. In this case, I'll use some AK Interactive Ultra Matte just to make sure it's nice and dull. I'll probably put like a drop of satin varnish in it as well, maybe one or two, just to thicken it up a little and increase the durability but it'll still be a very matte, much more matte than it is here, take on it. So back over to the painting desk in just a moment, but now you can see, look how much more rich and aligned all those colors look because of that glaze. Now we've got this beautiful transition taking us up through all these colors. Uh, and that's the, that's the beauty of what you get out of that glaze, right? That final step, that's what snaps it all together. So back at the desk in just a moment. All right, so we're back over here at the painting desk. You can see everything is nice and even in its finish now as the varnish is all dry. So now becomes the, there, now's the time where we just, we wanna finish out our details. So part of what that means is getting everything in order here, adjusting all the small things, edges, all the stuff that the airbrush is not fine enough to control, right? On any miniature you're gonna run into like this, like this one's kind of a, a hyper example of it, but the reality is no matter what the miniature is, the airbrush, you, you could stop here. I'll, I'll say that, like if you're just interested in kind of, you know, having the piece and, and you're happy with this, hey, stop, cool, you're good to go. But my recommendation would be at very minimum, you wanna take, you know, here something dark. So I've got my Payne's Gray ink uh, with a little bit of flow improver. Okay, and what I'm going to do is come to each of these little cuts that are in his armor. And we're just going to darken those right down. If I get any ink where it shouldn't be, we can easily just wipe it off there. We'll get the center of this chaos star he has. This guy just has like chaos stars everywhere. And the ink makes it really easy to do this because ink already flows very well. When we mix the ink with the flow improver, it gets even easier. We're going to trace out that chaos star very lightly. That way I can make sure I have a nice shadow for that because that'll obviously be metal later. And that gives me the edges for that and lets me actually see kind of that space it's going to occupy. So a nice, easy, quick, just, you know, sharp brush. This is a size zero, RAF 8404. And the idea here is it's hard to tell when you've got a lot of you know, sort of detail like this in the way. Same thing is true on a lot of the chaos shields where you need to sort of establish this big blend. But then at the same time, you also have all this other nonsense in the way, right? And so it's good to kind of just give everything a nice little dark line understand exactly what all your, your shadows are gonna be, that kind of thing. Okay, we'll hit all the rivets as well. Make sure those are nice and dark. Okay, so once we've got all those done and we have a pretty good idea of what we're dealing with here as far as, now it's much easier to see how that star stands out against everything. So the other thing we're gonna to wanna to do is obviously create all of our edges. So here I've got a little bit of the original glacier blue. And what we're gonna do is just come into all the armor. We've got it thinned down with a little flow improver and we're just gonna to side of the brush, hit all our edges. Again, we always turn the mini if we can't easily access the, the, uh, the edge. Nice light touch. Okay. And just keep rotating the mini around in our hand so that way we always have easy, easy access to the edges. Don't, uh, don't try to just draw it, like don't try to attack it straight on. If you can in any way just turn the miniature around, just keep flipping it and achieve the same thing. Now we're also gonna need to get the, the edges here 
these sort of standout boxy edges that he has. Now here I'm going to do this with this glacier blue, but I doubt I'm going to leave them all this color. But by making it this light tone, it's easy for me to come back in later and just apply some glazes here and there if I want to knock the contrast out. So quite easily I could come back into that boxy edge and I could uh, I could just take a nice thin glaze of that crimson like you saw me do earlier and uh, we could just run that right over the top and boom, because it's a super light color, it's going to transform any of the dark colors underneath would not. We'll also want to hit the lower edges of all these cuts just like they just like we would if they were painted on battle damage. So if you've seen my uh, how to paint battle damage video, you know that I we always find the edge sort of away from the light. So in this case, it would be the bottom of all these. And we give that a little highlight. Okay, I want to make sure we get every one of them. And again, this is another one of those things where like a simple glaze can correct it later so we can bring it all back into line if we feel like that's too extreme. Final thing we want to do is we want to make sure we come in and just kind of set our highlight to be really bright in the places where it's going to be really bright. So I start by just establishing a nice bright line like that. And then we add a little more water to the what's already on our brush. And then we just do a nice little glaze of it all around that. Okay, that way we just fade it out. And we'll take a little bit of that original pink color. Mix that in there as a nice thin glaze. And just feather that edge right out. And just feather that edge right out. All right. And then boom, we get a nice blend just that easy. If we need a little bit of time, if it doesn't look quite as smooth, just sit there, let it dry. And then we just run up over all that. And there we go. All right, easy peasy. So, and if we wanna, just showing you what it would look like to turn that those bright whites into something a little more perhaps reasonable for this spectrum. You just grab a little bit of that glaze. And we just go right over the top of each of these cuts. And just turn them pink. And there we can bring them sort of back in the line. So you can see how they still show, but they're not quite as obnoxious and bright. If you don't like that, you could always make a slightly brighter pink and continue to adjust. A lot of the work is refinement with anything like this. It's not just like, oh, we're gonna magically do it all in one step. I think that's a challenge a lot of people have. They try to just sort of like, here's the steps I take, A, B, C. The problem is a lot of work when it comes to stuff like this is just sort of finding your way. You test something, you make it a certain color, you see how it looks. If it looks nice, you keep it. If it doesn't look nice, you adjust it. There's no, there's no other way to really go about it. So, there you go, that's kind of it. The only other thing I might do is take a little bit of the darkest color here, my ink, thin that into a glaze, and just as a final step, come up into those dark corners and really make sure that my lines are nice and crisp and that those shadows are real dark and shadowed, right? So we just kind of, in the same way, we pushed that, that highlight up, we can push that shadow way down. And that gives us that nice full gamut of controlled contrast. So there you go. That's basically the armor. Now I'm just going to repeat this around on everything else. Uh, so, if you liked this, give it a like. Uh, I hope this was helpful for everybody who wanted to see this recipe. It's a really fun color. I love how this looks. Uh, so, throw a like down there. I really appreciate it. It helps others find this video. 
Uh, subscribe for additional hobby cheating. We have new videos here every Saturday. If you have any questions, drop those down in the comments. But as always, I very much appreciate you watching this one, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.